Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good luck. So, I'm told that we're supposed to start on time. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Jim Hyde. And uh, let's just open this meeting and uh, take a second to ask God in here and we'll start with the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, we are going to go through the fourth step, and we're going to go through it as it's written in the big book. I'm going to share some of my experiences on what happened with me and why, you know, I'm sober today. And I wasn't sober a little over 11 years ago. As a matter of fact, 11 years ago today, I was having my last drink and I was almost dying. And so on Monday, I'll celebrate 11 years if I make it to Monday. Ah, you didn't know that. This is an informal group. We're going to have, anytime you have a question, don't raise your hand, just shout it out. And if you would, just everybody just introduce yourself by your first name. Rhonda. Rhonda. Rick. Rick. I'm Willie. Willie. My name is Donna. 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 Okay. Well, welcome. Um, the um, the four step is is tremendous. Only if you've done the first three steps. You know, it doesn't matter if you haven't done the first three steps, and there's no point in coming here and doing anything on the four step. In my opinion, has everybody here got a sponsor? Okay. Everybody done the first three steps to the best of your ability? Okay. So here we are. Um, the first step, you know, is found about 30 pages into the book. It's not, I'm powerless over alcohol, my life's unmanageable. The first step of recovery is admitting to my innermost self, conceding to my innermost self that I was alcoholic, that the idea that I was like other people had to be smashed. You know, and that's that's exactly what the book says, you know, and that's exactly what it is to me. We're into 50 pages before we even get to the third step. So the first 45 pages, plus or minus, are all about the first and second step. And that's whether or not you're thoroughly convinced that you can't drink like other people. And if you think you can, then you probably have another drunk left in you. And that's what happened to me, is I thought I could after nine months of coming to the program and doing the best I could. I was not working the steps. Uh, I did not have a sponsor. But I'd been coming in and out for three years. And I, I put down the drink, and I thought I was great. And after nine months, uh, a gentleman came here, spoke at this building, and I was kind of encouraged to get him as my sponsor, and I did. And we were going to meet on Monday, and this was a Saturday night. And on Sunday, I decided that I had gone nine months without a drink. I could drink. I could have one drink. One drink. Now, I bought a half gallon of whiskey because I was going to have one drink. Now, that (laughs) that shows you my thoughts, okay? And that's where this disease, this illness, centers, is in our mind. It's not necessarily in the bottle. It's in our mind. And that's when I became thoroughly convinced that I was a mental defect, as the doctor calls it. I do have something wrong in my brain. I do have something that's called alcoholism. And so I had to do something about it. And luckily, when I called the man on Monday, he was willing to take me through the steps and get me started on the road to recovery. And I haven't found it necessary. I've I've gone through a lot, but I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink to try to solve my problems. I thought drinking solved my problems all those years. And I didn't realize that drinking was just a symptom of my problems. I had to look deep inside myself. So, admitting and conceding that I'm an alcoholic. You know, I never grew up thinking I wanted to be an alcoholic, and I think it's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, because my life in the past 11 years, I probably wouldn't be here, but I'm not in jail, and I'm not hurting anybody, and that's important to me today. I got an 18-year-old son who's grown up in these rooms, and, and he's very happy that his dad's not in jail or dead, too, so... We uh, we get to the third step right after how it works. And it says to us that, you know, we have made a decision. And I find that when I'm working any of the steps with anybody, if they're having trouble with a step, 
then we need to step back. We need to go back to a step before. And so when we say the third step prayer that um, God, I offer myself to thee to build with thee and do with me as you will, to relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do your will, take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear, may bear witness to those I would help with thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. And then it says, right after that, we thought long and hard about taking this step. And why would they put that promise at the end? People call them warnings, they call them threats. I'd say the book's full of promises. It says, because we're turning our will and our lives, which I'm taught, or my thought and my actions, over to the care of a power I can't see. I wasn't raised religious, don't know much about church, but I can tell you I believe that there is a power working in my life today. More today than I thought when I first came in here. But God didn't scare me off. You know, admitting I was crazy had me keep drinking. Saying to myself, I'm going to write down everything I've done wrong in my life, my resentments and the four step, and then share it with somebody. That kept me drinking. And it all comes back to what centers in my mind. And that's that I'm selfish and self-centered. And the book talks about that too. And we'll find that self is, is really the driving force behind most alcoholics. And I can't say anybody else. And anytime I do that, I'm saying me. You know, this, I'm using my experience. So the third step is really important because we're making a decision. We're finally, instead of using our minds in the first and second step, we're actually using our minds again in the third step by making a decision, but we're making a decision that we're going to do something about those first two steps, which means we're going to continue working this 12 steps. All right? So what we're going to do, is everybody done the third step? To the best of your ability. That's that's the best thing, because that's all you can do, especially when you're, you're doing this for the first time. Um, I've done a number of four steps. There are people that don't need to do another four step. I've just found that things have come up during my life that I needed to do another four step. Not so much the searching and fearless one on everything, all my defects, but certain things that have popped up. I've needed to write them down, what they're doing, the cause and conditions, and what the effect is. And then I've been able to share it with somebody. Um, Willie currently is the man that I use as my sponsor. I've had two other sponsors that I've worked with, and I've always felt comfortable. It says in the book that we find a closed mouth friend that we can share these, these things that we call secrets with. And our secrets will kill us. And that's what the book tells us more than one time. It's these things that we're just not willing to tell somebody will drive us back to drink. And we'll get to a page in here that talks about dying or getting killed, promises, five times on one page. And I believe exactly what this book says. And that's why I say we're going to read it line by line. So we're going to go to page... Really, I'm going to start on page 62. And anytime we get to a word, I'm one of these guys that's going to sit down a little bit, but anytime we get to a word, I've got a big book dictionary up here. We can look it up. Now, at the bottom of page 62, it says, after the third step, when we don't have any reservation about that third step, it says, next we launch on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. Though our decision, and that's the decision in the third step, was a vital and crucial step, it could have limit, little permanent effect unless at once, okay, at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Now, blocking us from what? Blocking us from God of our understanding. Blocking us from the spirit of the sunlight, the spirit of the universe, whatever you want to call your God, that's fine. I had to come to believe that there was a power greater than myself. I choose to call it God. I don't know how to explain it to you, and I'm not supposed to explain it to you. Each one of us is supposed to find our own conception of a God, and that's why this program has worked for so long. It is not a religious program. It's a program to help us develop a spiritual lifestyle <laughs> that we can use to fill that void that we used to use to fill with alcohol. Now, whether or not you believe that um, that the steps are supposed to be taken, you know, quickly, whether you've heard, well, I take a step a month, you know, my sponsor says take it easy. There's a couple of words that the book 
uses. I just read one. It says followed at once. You know, at once. I don't know how fast at once is to anybody else, but that usually means as soon as I'm done with my prayer, I'm supposed to be starting to take a pen and a piece of paper and start to write down these things. So, after it says it's been blocking us, it, this is the first time it tells me that alcohol is not my problem. Okay? It says our liquor was but a symptom. We had to get down to the causes and conditions. And so if alcohol is not my problem, I've stopped drinking now by this time. What's my problem? Well, my problem is centered in my mind, right? And so we started a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no inventory usually goes broke, okay? And it talks about it's a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It's an effort to discover the truth about ourselves, our stock and trade, and it's to disclose damaged and unsaleable goods, things that we can't use, the defects of character that we're going to uncover ourselves, we need to get rid of. We're going to get rid of them later on, but right now we have to we have to find out what they are. We have to discover them. And so we're going to disclose the damaged and unsaleable goods and get rid of them promptly and without regret. Now you've heard before in the nine step promises, you know, we won't regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. That's called the ninth step promises. There's promises all the way up until the ninth step, you know. But what we got to do is we've got to find this stuff out. We've got to find out what drove us to do these things. Then we have to get rid of it. And we have to get rid of it and not look back and say, well, you know, I wish I hadn't gotten rid of that or I wish I hadn't asked for that to be relieved. And it says that a business, to be successful, you can't fool yourself about the value. And the value is inside of each one of us. You know, it's the value of our lives, it's the value of what we do, it's the value of human being, you know, what we are. Now, we did the same thing with our lives, we did the exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out our flaws and our makeup, which caused our failure. And then it says, being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what has defeated us, we considered its common common manifestations. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was out there drinking, I'm not a very bright guy, you know. I carry around two pieces of paper in my big book. One was in 1972, a front page article about me being arrested and going to jail. And the second piece of paper was a GED that I got while I was on the chain gang. And none of the scores are higher than a 60. So I'm not a real intelligent person. So when I'm out on the street drinking and doing the things I did, using words like mount, um, manifestation or any of these other big words was not something I used. So I have a dictionary, like I said, and I have to look these things up. You know, what did it do? Why did it make me do these things? What did self do to Jim to make him want to do the things he did? If alcohol is not my problem, Jim is my problem. So I got to discover that, and that's what we're doing. And the first thing it talks about is resentment. It says it's our number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stems all forms of spiritual de- disease, for we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we've been spiritually sick. Now this is this is a big key for me, is when it tells me that not only do I have no control once I start drinking, it tells me I don't have any control when I stop drinking because I'm spiritually sick. And if I'm spiritually sick, then I gotta get centered with God before my mental illness and my physical illness can be cured. So that's what the program to me is. It's always been a spiritual program. And I think very strongly that this program really was the hand of God working in some drunk lives back in the thirties. You know? And I really believe today that because this book has not been changed in 73, 75 years, something like that, since 1939. It's been working for millions of alcoholics that are willing to do this. But they're willing to do it one day at a time. You know, and that's the biggest key is I can't be projecting what's going to happen tomorrow and I can't be regretting yesterday. I got to be willing to do this program one day at a time. I got to live my life one day at a time. I got to incorporate this into my life one day at a time. And so, like I said, I wasn't raised religious. The thing I was taught is I do get out on my knees in the morning and I ask God for help with my day. 
I still ask him to keep me away from a drink. It worked 11 years ago. Why would I stop what's working today? You know? All right. Resentments. And it says it's the number one offender. It says in dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Okay, we list people's institution and principles with, this we, with whom we were angry. And then we asked why we were angry. And in most cases, we found that there was a, a number of things. Our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambition, our personal relationships, and it says including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore or we were burned up. So has everybody got a piece of paper? Because if you don't, I've got paper and pen up here. I'm going to just do some little exercises. Okay. Everybody, everybody in a pen? Okay. You want a pen? Okay. You want a table? Table you put together in that way if it breaks, it should fall. Right here. <laughs> so, you know, I'd like to put it together. Okay. <laughs> You're talented, Rick. I know you can do that. I don't know. I have my sphere. <laughs> Now, in the book, you just see three columns there, right? But we're going to read where there's a couple more columns to come into play, and I'm going to show you something somebody showed me a little while ago that I thought was pretty good, too. You know, it says right there, once you write on the top of the page, just put an R. We're going to just say it's resentment, okay? And then draw, like, um, five little columns, you're just going to use this one page for resentments, and I'm going to have uh, you do different pages for other things. But let's just go through the book one at a time. So we're going to call this resentments, and it shows you three things right there. It says, on our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. Now, the names are coming from those three things. We listed people, institution, and principles with whom we were angry. I'm not here to do a fist step with anybody. And so this is just a general exercise to show you how it works, okay? So I don't expect to look at any of your lists. I don't want to see them. I don't even care if they're real, you know? But this is what we do. We write down the people, institutions, and principles that we were resentful at. And when you do a list, there's a couple ladies in here, we do the list like a grocery list. So we start in our first column. We write down who we were resentful at. We don't write anything next to them. We just write down who we were resentful at. What principal institutions? The book talks about a couple examples. You know, he's resentful at Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, his employer, his wife. So there's just four. He writes those four down. Once he writes them down, He's going to write down next to him the cause. So he's resentful at those four people, and now he's going to write down the cause. All right? For Mr. Brown, and Mr. Brown, you know, there's t-shirts out there saying Mr. Brown's an ass, and somebody should kill Mr. Brown, and these are all AA joke t-shirts. Anybody can make them up. Mr. Brown was paying the butt to this guy, apparently. Because he's the cause of his resentment was his attention to his wife, told his wife about his mistress, and he might get his job at the office, you know. And so he writes down next to Mr. Brown the cause of his resentment. Why is he mad at Mr. Brown? Why is he mad at Mrs. Jones? Well, she's a nut. She snubbed him. Of course she's a nut. She snubbed him. She committed her husband for drinking, he's his friend, and she's a gossip. That's the cause of his resentment against Mrs. Jones. When he writes down by his employer... He's pretty quick about having a resentment. The guy's unreasonable, he's unjust, he's overbearing. And he threatens to fire him for drinking and padding his expense account. Now, I don't think you should be fired for drinking and padding your expense account, but apparently his employer does, you know. And that's the cause of his resentment against his employer. 
and then his wife. Well, she misunderstands and nags. She likes that Mr. Brown up there, and she wants to put the house in her name. Well, I can tell you from personal experience, when my ex-wife wanted to put the house in her name, I kind of knew what was going on. She wasn't a Mr. Brown involved. She just wanted to have control because she was getting ready to divorce me, you know, and that's, I was a little resentful. I was very resentful at my ex-wife for a long time until I made amends to her because I had been a drunk for years and she had put up with it, you know, and she didn't do anything to deserve my behavior. Um, and she had every right to divorce me. Okay, so there's the two columns right there, the who I'm resentful at and the cause. And the next column, it says, it affects mine. You know, it affects my what? Well, with Mr. Brown talking to his wife about his mistress, of course it affects his, his sex relationships. It affects his self-esteem. Um, it affects his uh, security. And next to those three words, you'll see a word in a bracket. And we'll get to that in the next page. But, you know, Mr. Brown's effect in his relationship with his wife <clears throat> his sex relationship is affecting his job, that's his security, and, you know, he's given attention to his wife. Well, that's affecting his self-esteem. You go down to Mrs. Jones, well, you know, she's snubbed him, she's a nut, she committed her husband, she's a gossip. It really, you look at, what is that affecting, why do I have a resentment? Why has this guy got a resentment? Well, Again, it's his personal relationship and self-esteem. And it's right there in the book. Again, there's a word bracketed. <clears throat> Your employer, it's his security and self-esteem. And, uh, and his wife, his pride, his personal sex relationship with her, and his security. Now, after that column that affects mine, we're going to figure out, you know, where I was to blame. I use a five-column inventory, and and some people use a three-column inventory, but if you read, you'll find out that it tells you to put down a couple other things, so I just do it at the beginning. Um, the five-column inventory goes on and says, where was I to blame? What had I done? And it tells me where in the book to do that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to hand out one of these to everybody after you go on ahead and written it out, just to show you how it's done by somebody else. And so you see where it says, where was I to blame? It says in the book, and we'll read it in a minute, exactly why. It says that putting out of my mind, out of my mind, the wrongs others have done, I look at my own mistakes what is the exact nature of my wrong? What did I do? And it says to be specific. What did I do because I was burned up or because I was sore? You know, it, it says, what did I do to cause this? What is the cause and condition? You know, the cause is over there, but what did I do? And then it says in the fifth column, where, I, where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? What about an inconsiderate? Those are what we consider defects of character. And what we're going to do, we'll go back to the book. We went through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent, okay, the first thing apparent, was that the world and this people and its people were often quite wrong. Now that's you know that's what we conclude. Conclude that others are wrong was about as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war only the victors seemed to win, our moments of triumph were short lived. A lot of big words. But what it's saying is, you know, what I did is when I was resentful, everybody else was always wrong. When I was resentful at, at my ex-wife, she was wrong. And then I drank. And then I got more resentful because then my job was affected. And then I drank. And it was this vicious cycle. 
So what happened when I got sober is I had to look at why was I doing this? And I thought it was because my ex-wife was trying to get the house and get all my money and leave. And it wasn't. What it was is I drank because I liked the effects produced by alcohol. And it says that in the doctor's opinion at the very front of the book. I'm like 1% of the population. When I drink alcohol, something goes on in my body that doesn't happen to normal people. I continue to drink. I drink past the point of no return, and I do it for so long that it not only warped my mind, it killed my body from the inside, and it destroyed my spirit. That's what I did. Now, what you did is what you did. But what we're looking for in this resentment column is we're looking for our own our own. There, there's not a place in the book that says, I'm looking at my part. It never says, look at your part. It says, disregard the other person entirely, and let's look at our own things. Our own... And I have a... Yeah. Pardon me for interrupting. Mm-hmm. I have a question in this sure. direction. Um, and I guess at base, my question is whether step four is linked to step nine, where one makes amends whether when you get to step nine, and obviously I'm not there, you have to show the sheet of paper. <laughs> and it relates to precisely this point in your example about marriages. Now, I, I well understand that there can be wrong of multiple sides. It's not just one person or the other. Mm-hmm. And let me just use artificial numbers. Let's say with respect to a past relationship right. that I can see that I'm a third wrong. Okay. Or maybe it's two thirds. Okay. But that leaves wrong for somebody else too. If I'm only a third wrong and the other person is two thirds wrong, am I going to have to go make amends for my one third when, when I get to step nine? When you get there, you might, but we don't know that, do we? Because what you're doing is right now in step four, you're assuming that they're two thirds wrong because you're right. Okay, point taken. Point okay, point taken. You're, you're, saying, you're saying right here, I'm right, they're wrong, it's cut and dry. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't no, know. I, I accept responsibility, but I think there was... Well, let me let me just... Response on the other side. I know we're not at nine. Right. But this does matter to how I fill out the form. Well, it matters because you're supposed to be looking at yourself. I understand that. You're not supposed to be... I think, even, I, think I do really understand that. And, and we're going to get to something where we talk about looking at it from an entirely different angle. Okay. 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 But but the answer to your question is absolutely, and it's not in step nine; it's in step eight. Okay, step nine is when you make those direct amends wherever possible. Yeah, well, that's what I'm. Okay, doing. step eight is where you make the list. Because you know, when you get to step nine, it, if you amend, then that implies that it was sort of a hundred percent on your part, and that I'm not willing to accept intellectually. Right? I know. Maybe, maybe that'll change. And intellectually, you probably won't. Spiritually, by the time you get there, maybe you will. All right. Maybe you'll be willing to say to yourself, it doesn't matter what they did for me to get healed, for me to get better. Because that's what we're trying to do is get ourselves better. We're not trying to get anybody else sober. We're not trying to, you know, change the world. We're trying to get this stuff out of ourselves. But when I first got here, people were always talking about, you know, I burnt my four-step list after I did it with my sponsor. You know, I wrote out these horrible things and I burned it. And it doesn't say anywhere in the book Destroy your four-step list. Later on in the book, it'll say, refer you back to our list of the people we have harmed. Okay. Okay? And those are the ones that we have to look at whether we're making amends to them or not. And we have to look at it from a different point of view. Right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring all this garbage out because we're going to share it with somebody, right? I mean, we are going to share these secrets with somebody. And my secrets were pretty awful, you know? I didn't kill anybody, I didn't rape anybody, but I can tell you this, I'd done some awful things that I swore I was never going to share with anybody. Welcome! Are you here for a four-step sonar? I could use one. You you could use one? Yeah. Is that what you're here for? I've done the four-step, but I actually came to see Donnie. Who? Donnie Snow. And where is he? Isn't that here? No, you're in the wrong room. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. One of the yep. guys told me he was in here. No, he's not in here. I, I lived down in Lauderdale, and I hate to interrupt. That's, that's, that's okay. He might be here at the he's six. Of, he might be here at the seven o'clock speaker meeting tonight. It starts at eight. He oh, might okay. be here then. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, all right. Um, go ahead. Um, looking ahead. Most 
important people that I know that I have to make amends to are not people that I have resentments mm-hmm. for. Mm-hmm. Is that where, where do we put them? We're going to they put don't them. go on this list. No, but we're going to make another list. We're going to make another list. We're going to make four lists while we're here. Okay. We're going to have four separate lists. We're working on resentments right now. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I can relate to that. Okay. It says right there on page 66 that it's plain that a life which includes deep resentments leads only to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander, which is, you know, what's a, what's a short word for squander? You're intelligent, Rick. How about you? Waste. Yeah. Waste. You know, we, um, we squander the hours that might be worthwhile. With the alcoholic whose hope is to, now listen to this, this is really important here. With the alcoholic whose hope is the maintenance and growth of the spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it's fatal. Now, there's two words right there that says, this will kill us. Holding on to these resentments will kill us. Alright? That's two words. Because when we're harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The sanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And for us, with us, to drink is to die. That right there talks about me. I know for a fact if I put up a drink, I can't drink one. I'm going to drink the bottle, and I'm going to kill myself. I have first-hand experience with that. And I'll just tell you two quick stories. One is, my little brother could not get, and did not, get this program. He was what they call in how it works, the cannot and will not. Those are the two type of people who will not get sober and stay sober is the cannot and will not. Completely give themselves to the simple program. He came in and out of the program. He got five DUIs. His last son was a felony DUI. He hit somebody. He was 10 years younger than me. And he loved me growing up. He idolized me even though I was in jails and juvenile homes for most of his youth. But he loved me, and I loved him. But he just wouldn't understand that he had the same problem I did. He came in, got a white chip, came in, got a big book, and just said, a spiritual way of life, Jim, it's just not me. And after his fifth DUI, he was going to go to prison for five years. And they gave him a monitoring bracelet on his ankle that monitored his sweat glands, not his location. And I didn't even know about those things. And he didn't drink for over a year. But during his entire active alcoholism, he didn't go to the doctor. We tend to shy away from doctors, dentists, anybody that can help us. We don't want to know them to know we're drinking. And we definitely don't, we're not honest with them, that's for sure. You know, how much do you drink? Oh, a couple of beers. I drink a couple of beers to get going, and then I drink a bottle. You know, I don't finish the sentence. So he came down with some serious health issues. As a matter of fact, he was in a coma, and I was in Georgia, and I was called, and I rushed down here. There's a long story behind it. But when he came out of the coma, he had ten tumors, because he'd never gone to the doctor. And these were tumors that were all generated because of excess alcohol in his body. But he hadn't drank in a year. Okay? And what happened to him is that he got let off of probation, he got the bracelet cut off because he had to do radiation and chemotherapy. We came to a meeting from his parole office here at Central, and we went to have lunch. And he said, I just want to have one glass of wine. Now, they just gave him six months to two years to live. But they gave him six months as a short term and two years as a great term if he just, you know, took care of himself. He did the radiation. He did. He, they weren't going to give him chemotherapy. And he had a glass of wine with lunch. I thought it was a bad idea. I'd been around and watched people. What happened? On the way home, he asked me to stop by the liquor store, and he bought a bottle of wine. He said, I'm just going to drink this a little bit. Well, within 30 days, I came back from Georgia, and I held his hand when he took his last breath. And he was given six months to two years. He died in 30 days because he picked up a glass of wine. He was an alcoholic. He admitted he was an alcoholic. But he also said, I cannot and I will not do this simple program. I don't want this spiritual way of life. 
And so four years ago, he died at the age of 44. And I came in these rooms at the age of 44. I didn't get sober at 44, but I came in and I started hearing what y'all were telling me. And it sank in. You know, the one thing they tell you is you come to an AA meeting more than one time, AA will screw up your drinking. It's no longer fun. I can no longer say I'm drinking because. Because people in the room are telling me, you know, what their experience is. If I'm listening to people who are sober talking, if I'm listening to people who are here crying just because they got problems, okay, group therapy. That's not what AA started. That's not what AA is today. Real AA is people talking about how these steps are working in their life, how God's working in their life on a daily basis. All right. So we're, we're sitting there. We've got three things right now. Three things are telling us that if we're going to drink or we're going to hold on to resentments, it's going to kill us. If we were to live, we had to be free of this anger, the resentment cause, the grouch and the brainstormer for us. Dubious luxuries of normal men, but for the alcoholic, these things are poison. All right, poison. There's the fourth word that talks about us dying. You know? uh, Go ahead. Oh, I, 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 I'm with you now. Okay. I, I lost you. All right, we're, we're, yeah, we're at the end of the third paragraph on page 66. Okay. All right. Now, we turn back to the list where it held the key to our future. Uh, our, the key to our future, that's the key to the rest of my life. I think this list is going to be important. We were, prepared to, we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In this state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had the power to actually kill. That's the fifth time that you used something about killing us. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We couldn't wish them away any more than we could wish to quit drinking. All right? And it says right there, we had to look at them from an entirely different angle. I've heard examples of, in my case, it, it worked really well. You know, I was never a plaintiff in a courtroom. I was always the defendant. So I was always trying to defend myself from the actions that I took that was putting me in prison. So if I had to look at it from an entirely different angle, what I have to do, I had to go over to the prosecutor's table and look at it from their angle. Or, which was easier for me, is I had to take myself out of that chair where I'm sitting and go get in my wife's shoes and look at it from my wife's point of view, my ex-wife's point of view. I had to look at it from her angle to see what I had been doing. All right? So when I look at it from an entirely different angle, I get to the bottom of that page. I realize that, you know, my wife was perhaps spiritually sick. Other people possibly could have been wrong, but if they wronged us, did they really wrong us, or was I just assuming they wronged us? And if I assumed they wronged us, would I also say, you know what, they could have been sick also. And it says, though, we didn't like their symptoms, this is page 67, the way they disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. And down at the bottom of that resentment, page I gave you. It says where this prayer is right here. It says that we ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. So if somebody's dying from cancer or somebody's ill and they lash out at us, do we sit there and hold a resentment against them? They're sick. They're not feeling good. Right? And if they're spiritually sick, how can we hold a resentment against somebody? If we're admitting to ourselves that we're powerless, and we're admitting to ourselves that God's restored to sanity, how can we now look at a sick person, spiritually sick person, and hold a grudge against them? So when a person offended us, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him or her or them? God save me from being angry. Your will be done. Now I change the things you know, thy, thou, uh, real biblical to me, and I have a hard time doing that, because like I said, I, I wasn't raised in religion or anything else. So I changed them to your will, or you, or or things like that, to make it easier for me to say. If I'm going around thy, and this, and thou, I, I feel like I need to have a robe, and I need to have a book under my arm, and carrying a cross, and I can't do all that, you know? 
But if I, if I turn it more to a personal use, your will be done. And I don't do it every time. I can't do it every time. I'm not perfect. But I do it more. The more I practice it each day, the more I do it. That when somebody offends me, or I take offense, whether you offended me or not, where it said fancied or real, fancied is, you say something to me, I'm offended, you didn't try to offend me. I just got offended. That's fancy. It's not real. And you could say something to me to offend me. You could say, you're a white-haired old man, and I could be offended. Or I could say, wow, I got to be a white-haired old man. Golly, I was supposed to die 20 years ago, and you know, here I am, white-haired old man. I'm pretty good, you know. So I can make it up. I can make up. That's fancy. It's made up. You know, and most of my resentments were fancy. I made them up. People didn't harm me. I took offense if somebody said, you're drinking too much. They weren't being offensive. They were telling me the truth. You know, especially if she said I was drinking too much, I drank more. You know, how dare you? You don't know how much I can drink. Well, you know, guess what? She wasn't trying to offend me. The next sentence says we avoid retaliation or argument because we wouldn't treat sick people that way. And if we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We can't be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kind and tolerant view of each and every one. You, know, you hear love and tolerance is our code. I guess that's our code. Um, I'd love to say I love and tolerate everybody. I don't. You know, to this day, I still get mad at people. I just don't hold on to it. Because I realize that if I hold on to anger, it makes me ill. First of all, it makes me spiritually, spiritually ill, but it makes me physically ill. You know, when I'm holding on to anger, when I'm arguing or retaliating, those things hurt me inside. They increase my heart rate, they create anxiety, they create headaches, they create all these other things that I don't like physically. And so I don't want to hold on to these things so I don't want to grab them in the first place. Now, it says, referring to our list again, putting out the minds of others, putting out of the minds of the wrongs others had done. Okay? That comes to your question, Rick. Putting out of our minds the others wrongs have done. Maybe they have. I swore they did. But I had to put there out. I had to look for my own mistakes. And this is where I found them. And, and I didn't like looking at them. But it's like that fifth column right there. Where had I been? You know, selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. Though a situation wasn't entirely my fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? And that's, you know, where was I to blame? That's that fourth column there. When we listed them, it says right there that we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. And that whole paragraph is talking about forgiveness for me. And I read a book that's not GSO approved and doesn't really do anything other than it was another spiritual book and it tells us that in the back in the spiritual appendix that we're not to close our mind to all spiritual concepts. So I read this other book, and it talked about forgiveness. And it talked about, for me to actually have the power to forgive you is almost like playing God. You know? Why should I have that power that I can forgive you? And it showed me an example of how I'm forgiving somebody, is I'm taking my hands off of your throat. You know? Because if I'm talking to you, and I have my hands on your throat, then I'm still accusing you, I'm still hating you, I'm still angry with you. But if I take my hands off of your throat, you know, I'm, I'm not holding that anxiety, that that hate, that resentment inside of me. And I am forgiving you. You know, God's forgiven me. Why can't I forgive you? God's forgiven you, I believe. But that's up to you and your God. I know my God's forgiven me. But I need to take my hands off of your throat if I'm going to be about <laughs> forgiveness. All right, back to that uh, that column in the book. Next to those things, it's back on 65. And, and the next paragraph is going to talk about it. The the word I was talking about that was um, in parentheses throughout Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, 
his employer and his wife. And it says fear. And it says right there in that next paragraph, fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties of Mr. Brown, the employer, Mrs. Jones, his wife. The short word somehow touches every aspect of our life. You know? And I know today that a lot of my resentments, a lot of my my self-centeredness revolved around my fear. You know? And I didn't think I was a fearful person. I thought I was a pretty strong man. I, you know, I was raised that way. But really and truly inside, inside myself, I was fearful. And you hear this, I'm afraid I'm going to lose something or I'm afraid that I'm not going to get what I want. Well, both of those things started with the same thing. I'm afraid I'm going to lose something or I'm afraid. That's another form of self. And all of these things are self-manifesting myself into what's happened inside my body. What's happened inside my heart. It's closed my heart, it's closed my mind to spiritual concepts is myself. Alright? The fear, it says it's an evil and corroding thread, the fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It sets in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune, which we felt we didn't deserve. But did we not ourselves set that ball rolling? Now, yes or no? You know, did you set the ball rolling? Did you start it? Donna? I give a good example. Okay. I, um, I never got fired from a job because, frankly, because I was an alcoholic or because I was drinking. But um, during the time I was drinking, you know, I acted out all the time. And so that got me in trouble. Sent to anger management, you know, put on um, probation at work, whatever. And I was afraid that I was going to lose my job. Ultimately, I did. But I created that. You know, that fear that I was afraid that I was going to lose my job was not because of all those people. It was really because I acted out. So, I mean, I ultimately did lose the job. I was drinking at the time. It wasn't directly related to alcohol. But that fear, you know, I I created the situation that gave me that fear of getting fired. Problems of our own making, what the book says, right? That's exactly right. And, I, and that's what we do as alcoholics. We create the situation. Um, the two words on, uh, let me go back real quick to that. I was going to bring this up. But the two words, retaliation and argument. You know, we, we avoid retaliation and argument. I use the scenario, I have six communication skills. All right? So the six communication skills are, I talk to you, I have a conversation with you, I have a discussion with you. Those three right there are as far as Jim can go with communicating. Because after I have a discussion with you, I'll move into I have a debate with you. You're not you're not seeing my side of the debate. I'm going to show you my debate. I argue with you. And if you're not done agreeing with me that I'm right by the argument, what do you think my sixth form of communication is? I'm in a fight. I'm in a fight for my life to prove I'm right. So I've gone from talking to us having a conversation, us talking back and forth, to us having a discussion, us discussing something, and I need to stop right there. The book tells me I've got to resign from the debating society. And after the discussion, I'll move right into debate. And a debate is what? It's one person saying they're right, it's another person saying they're right, and that leads to an argument, that leads to a fight. I didn't know that ten years ago. I found that out about a year ago, that I only have six ways to communicate. So I need to stop after the third one, or I'm going to be getting in a debate, and I'm going to be the one feeling the, the effects. You'll go home, but I'll still be in my mind having that debate and what I should have said to prove you wrong. Why do I have to prove you wrong? Why do I have to play God? You know, I don't have to play God. I don't want to play God. The book tells me I played God for a long time, and I didn't believe it. You know, I was a good manager. Well, I wasn't really a good manager either. And that's why my life was a manual. It had nothing to do with alcohol. All right, so it says that, you know, we think that fear ought to be classified with stealing. It causes more trouble. <clears throat> and what I learned is it steals my mind. You know, just like you said, 
It wasn't the drinking that caused me to lose the job. It was the fear of losing my job that had me lash out at people, and I lost my job, you know. Um, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. Whoop, there we go again. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection. We asked ourselves why we had them. All right, so it's already asked us to put resentments, right? So we put resentments on paper. So now it says fear. We put fear on paper. So instead of handing you another piece of blank paper, I'm going to hand you this. Can I ask you a question? Sure, you can. I, I've done my list of it was a few months ago. And sure. I'm, I'm not through all my steps yet. Okay. I wanted to come to the workshop. Sure. I can't always learn more. And, um, started sponsoring people a little bit. And, but I have a question because I always get stuck here. On three, the column three where it says affects my... What are the things when under resentment affects my what? Well, when you write them down... And resentment affects your whole your whole life, but does it affect? And the column in the book talks about it. Your self esteem. But what does that mean when it says self esteem? Because I can, I mean I can give you an example. I don't I don't mind sharing. I mean I had a terrible week this week, and it was my own fault because I stayed in being resentful from stupid people all week that I just was stupid and that belonged to me and wasted my time and you know. I, since I've been in the program, I don't, I don't um, thank God anymore. I don't drink over it, and I don't um, carry it with me from day to day. It doesn't exhaust me because I used to, I used to carry those resentments home. I used to drink over them. I used to wake up with them. I used to add to them the next day. But this week, I got kind of hard on myself because, you know, I did it every day, every day this week. It was, you know, so I used an example from this week, and I put down this company that um, we use at work for transportation and translation. And they sent me seven emails, no, 17 emails actually, at, in one second on one person that were all completely unnecessary. So needless to say, that ticked me off. And I'm like, you're incompetent and you're wasting my time and, you know, whatever. And so I know in um, the, what did, where, what did I do? I know I was selfish and inconsiderate and dishonest because I, you know, sent them back an email that, you know, wasn't really nasty, but it wasn't very nice either. And so I know I was selfish, I was inconsiderate. I know I was dishonest because I didn't um, consider the fact that, you know, it was an innocent mistake. They certainly weren't out to get me, although that's how I looked at it. But under affects my, I'm not really sure what goes under affects my for that. Well, when, when you ask about self-esteem, okay? That's not going to be in every column, and every person is not going to say that. But what did it affect? Did it affect your security? No. It didn't affect your security. Well, I guess it did if I if I use the other sample of my own job, because I could create a situation where I'd be afraid I'd get get fired because I acted out to a certain degree. I mean, and I guess it affected my pride in that I looked at it from a prideful place. And that's what self-esteem is, isn't it? Isn't it how we think of ourselves? Isn't it what we do? And it says for us to have self-esteem, we have to do what? Esteemable things. We have to do the right thing if we want the right things to come to us. We have to pocket our pride, you know? Bill Wilson talks about the deflation of ego at death. He doesn't talk, he, de he doesn't talk about removing his ego. He talked about deflating it, because I thought more about myself than I thought about anybody else. And this whole program teaches me to think about other people more than I think about myself. Not less. Don't think about myself less, but think about other people more. I'm not nearly as prideful as I was when I came in here. I still have pride, but I try to pocket it when I go about my daily work. I don't try to put it out there and walk around saying I'm the best at everything. I'm not. I used to think I was. I used to drink because I was the best at everything. You know? Well, how stupid is that? You know, I look at it now going, go ahead and drink some more poison because you're so smart. You know? Do you see, do you see what I'm talking about on the self-esteem? Not all of them come in every category, but when I really sit and think about it, you know, if I'm getting all these emails, it's affecting me. And if it's affecting me, why? First off, I'm self. I'm self-consumed, and so they're affecting my security at work, they're affecting my self-esteem because of my pride, they're, 
they're writing these things about me and they shouldn't, and then I become doing the fancy. I become making these things up and making myself ill thinking about them because, you know, it really wasn't their intent. Maybe it was their intent, but we're sensitive people. I'm a sensitive person. I don't like to be told I'm wrong. So my self-esteem is kind of the, that make, I'm making up their intent. Yeah, well, if, if, you, if it's affecting your self-esteem, you're, it's fancy. It, it, you're doing it in your own mind, which is self. Related to my own mind. It, it's self. <laughs> okay. Called self-sabotage or, or self-destruction. Um, we, we're harder on ourselves than most people are, I can guarantee, as alcoholics. Mm-hmm. I am, I know that. Okay, so jumping ahead to fear. Alright, it says that we... Um, um, yeah, we put them on paper even though we had no resentment in connection with them. We ask ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it the self, self, again, self. Self-reliance failed us. Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had a great deal of self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other problem. And when it made us cocky, it was worse. So when I when I write down on this list, looking at your review of fears, you know, again it's the people, institution, or principles that I fear. Why am I afraid? What what do I fear? That's the cost right there. You know, am I going to lose something? Am I going to lose face? You know, am I going to lose a personal relationship? Might I lose my job? All those things. What's it affect? Well, it, you know, it could affect my security if I'm going to lose my job, my self-esteem, if people are going to look bad on me. You know, it could affect my personal or my sex relations. And, you know, they've been inferred, inferred with or threatened, interfered with. I'm sorry, not inferred, interfered with. And which part of me, which part of me, which is self, have I been relying on that has failed me? And it gives you four Four things, self-reliance, self-confidence, self-discipline, self-will. You know, what part was failing me? And what did I do to set the ball rolling? It says right there, what did I do to set the ball rolling and set the motion of trains that are the consequences, the circumstances which have led to my being in the position to have this fear? And if you look at the bottom, it's, it's a prayer from page 68. We haven't got there yet. And it's just God remove these fears of blank and direct my attention to what you'd have me be. If I'm all consumed in fear from my resentments or my fears and I'm consumed with that, then I'm really not going to be working very good on trying to be a spiritual being. You know? And it says, you know, in about another nine pages, it talks about our, our real purpose and that's to be a maximum of service to God and our fellows. And that's what the book's trying to teach us to do, is to get out of ourselves and to believe in a power greater than ourselves and do something, use use our life that we've got left to do something for that power by helping other people. Our real purpose to be a maximum service to God and our fellows. All right, it says, the next paragraph, perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For now, we're on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying on fun. Upon God. We trust finite, infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role that he assigns, just to the extent that we'll do what we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. Now that paragraph right there really takes you back to step three. You know, have I really made the decision to turn my thoughts and my actions over to this power greater than myself? My will in my life. Am I really willing to let God be the one in charge? My God is just like it says in the book. It's infinite. Infinite. A giant God. I, I share my God with anybody who wants to borrow a God because they said I can't, I can't find God. Well, I don't think I've found God. I just believe there is one and I believe he's all powerful and he can cure anything. You know? He cured my alcoholism. Because the book tells me by this, you know, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I'm not a cured alcoholic. Jim, I really like that uh, sentence. It's one that I've reread a number of times. As 
someone who was raised in a church, but left it certainly in my own mind in my mid-teen years, and then here my advanced age coming back and learning how to pray, um, and really not knowing how to pray, but picking up from from these rooms, as we say, that you're not supposed to pray to win the lottery or things of that nature. Selfish prayers. That's right. That it's supposed to be something else. Well, okay, well, what else? Well, I mean, the third step prayer is helpful in this regard. But but this passage speaks to that, especially that <clears throat> last phrase. Does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? It doesn't say you will not have calamity if you pray. Absolutely not. It doesn't say that at all. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, but it says that you'll find serenity in the face of calamity. So, you know, the first time I read it, I suppose my reaction was a glass half empty. Well, gee, that's not offering us much. You're just going to have serenity, but you'll still have calamity. But then on second thought, that's quite a lot. It could be worse. The biggest word in there, the best word in there, is how do I match calamity with serenity? Yeah. Is yeah. to humbly rely on that power. Mm -hmm. Humbly rely on that power. And if I'm humbly relying on the power that I believe is God, I'm not playing God. Mm -hmm. I've taken myself out of the director's chair. I'm no longer the manager of my life. Because even sober, I can't manage my life. That's the first step. My life's unmanageable by Jim. By myself, I can't do this. But if I humbly rely on God, then I can match calamity with serenity. And I, I told you I'm going to use my experience. Um, this past November, almost four years to the day that I held my little brother's hand, okay? I went to my property up in Georgia that I owned with my older brother. My older brother was a school teacher here in Central Florida, and he quit drinking when the school came to him, uh, he was about 10 years into teaching career, and they said, if you keep drinking, we're going to fire you. So he quit drinking. Just put it down. Didn't practice a spiritual way of life, didn't believe in God, didn't drink for 20 years. Okay, retired after 30 years as a school teacher. For 20 of those years, he just didn't drink. And he went up to Georgia with me. We bought 50 acres up there. He built a house. I've got a place. We built a barn. We were never close. He and I were never close at all. But we probably had the best times we ever had together up in Georgia. And, you know, I, he was in a woods person. I'm a woods person. But he decided he'd go up there with me. All right? Now, he started to drink. But if he... If he wanted to drink, he would. We're, we're 60 miles from the liquor store, believe it or not, in Georgia. I did not know that we bought in a dry county. He's the one who told me we bought in a dry county because it's just not something I pay attention to. But it was 60 miles to get to a liquor store. So every now and then he would go buy a booze, a bottle of booze that he likes, and he would drink it. Okay? No big deal. He wouldn't drink for six months. He decided that he wanted to drink. He'd go buy a bottle, he would drink it, and he wouldn't drink for another five or six months. This went on for four and a half, almost five years. I went up there last November. My brother had been dead 40 days. Almost four years to the day my little brother died, I found my older brother dead in this house. Okay? Why? Well, I don't ask why. That's God's job. But I can tell you it was absolute calamity for Jim to discover that. To have to climb up over the balcony knowing he was dead but having to prove he was dead before I called the sheriff's department. It was calamity to me. But I didn't want to drink. And I didn't want to do anything stupid. And I did the right thing. And this is not something I would have done when I was drinking. I can guarantee you I wouldn't have done that. You know, I called the sheriff's department, told them my brother's dead, been dead about four days. I'm an EMT. This is one of the things of sobriety, one of the miracles I talk about sometimes, is I got a GED from a chain gang and I took the most advanced medical course that you could take to become an EMT. And I successfully passed it with two B's and an A. You know, and this is 30-something years after I got out of the chain gang. How can you do that? I took the course. God took the test. <laughs> that's, that's the way I look at it. But because I have this thing called sobriety, 
from Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a God in my life. I knew exactly what to do. This calamity was going on all around me. You know, the ugliness, the smells, the sights, everything. I got the ambulance coming out. I got the coroner coming out. I called my sponsor. I called my support group at Central. I called my friends. And every one of those people were amazed, first off, that I discovered this. because That wasn't part of Jim's plan. And then they said, it's going to be all right. Are you okay? And I said, because I heard my sponsor's voice, because I heard some friends' voice that I got here at Central, and I got some friends over at College Park Triangle, I got some friends up at Longwood, I've got plenty of friends. I was able to then stop what I had to do. I needed to call my sister up in Columbus, Georgia, get her to come down. We had to go do the paperwork to get my brother cremated. And that smashing calamity was serenity. Was I totally at peace? No. Was my mind spinning? Of course it was. I mean, this is a horrible situation. But I knew what to do. I knew what to do. And I knew that night it was going to be all right. Now, for about a month, I had some horrible dreams. They're called grief dreams. And I know about grief dreams. Luckily, I was able to study it. I knew what was going on. The book says, if I need outside help, to get outside help. And I did. But the outside help was a lady who's a recovered alcoholic. And she does a mental health business too. I was able to talk to her. I was able to talk to my sponsor when I had these grief dreams and say, these things are horrible. But this is what I was going through. And throughout all of it, I was asking God to carry me through this. To get me to the other side. Without going crazy. Without doing something stupid. Definitely without drinking. I had no, I had no desire to drink, but I didn't know if I would with these dreams. The calamity of what happened in each individual's lives will hit calamity, like Rick said. How do we get to the other side of it? How do we walk to the other side of the bridge? We walk through it with God, and we walk through it with the fellows that we have seen walk through calamity before. There are people here at my home group that have walked through the same thing. Maybe they didn't find their brother dead. But somebody died and they were able to get to the other side. Those people I sought out. You know? The people in the, the outside world, as I call it, which is the world I live in for 23 hours a day, you know, they didn't really know how to help me. I mean, gee, Jim, I'm really sorry. That doesn't help Jim when he's spinning with these dreams. Jim, I understand what you're going through. Mary Jo, whatever her name is, went through the same thing. Why don't you sit with, why don't you sit with Bob? Bob's brother died, and this is what he did to get to the other side. And I have that today because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have that because there's a God in my life. I can match the calamities with serenity. I can get to the other side where I couldn't before. What are, what, Go ahead. What are grief dreams? Grief dreams? A grief dream is where you... Okay, let's say a nightmare. You know what a nightmare is, okay? It wakes you up. It scares you. Most of us at one time or another in our sobriety, we'll have drinking dreams. And we'll get awakened, you know, we're thinking, hey, I might have to go pick up a white ship or something like that. You hear that all the time. When you go back to sleep, your mind goes into a different dream. Your rapid eye movement, your REM dreams, will go, you'll go and dream about something else. Very seldom do you remember your dreams. In the old days, Bill and Bob, they would have a pad and a piece of paper by their bed. And what they were thinking was God's they believed God talking to them, so they would write it down. Okay? So a normal bad dream, a normal nightmare, you wake up, oh, man, that's scary. When you go back to sleep, you go somewhere else. A grief dream, you pick up where you left off. So it's so horrible, I'm standing over my brother, I'm looking at this horrible sight. I wake up, oh, my God, I can't stand that. I get up, you know, I get something to drink, maybe I go to the bathroom, I lay back down, I start going back to sleep. I don't go into a new dream. The human mind, during that period of grief, I go back into that same dream. And I'm back right where I was. So I couldn't sleep. There were times where I would go to bed, I'd wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I just couldn't go back to sleep because I knew where I was going to go. So I'd stay up the rest of the night. Sometime during the day I would take a nap because I'm old, like I said, and I have to take a nap. And it would be a different thing. But I had about a month worth of at night that's when it hit me. Some people get hit in the morning, some in the afternoon. Most people, 
Now, this is people that I talk to in this field of the mind field, psychologists, psychiatrists. Most people never in their life experience what I experience. They just never have that calamity. And I'm using the word calamity. I want to call it the most horrible thing, you know. Is it? I don't know. It was at that time. It was pretty horrible. And so the grief dream is nothing more than I go back to the same dream I was at. I don't get to go somewhere else. Okay? And I got through it. I got through it with God. Your brother was like the guy in the book. You think? He was like the guy who quit drinking so he could have the business. He retired. Out came the slippers and the bottle of scotch. And in four years he was dead. Right? What that tells me is the progressive illness of alcoholism doesn't stop just because I quit drinking. Do I, do I say that my brother died because he drank? No. Absolutely not. My brother didn't go to the doctor either. Okay? My brother was overweight. He had hypertension. He had prostate cancer. He'd already had one heart attack. He had all these health issues. And he didn't do anything about it. And so, what they came up with is, he had a heart attack. Okay? Congestive heart failure. That was, they didn't do an autopsy, you know, but in his house was no alcohol at all. But we didn't find out until afterwards that he'd been going to a doctor for all these other things, but in his medicine cabinet, there weren't any medicines, there weren't any diuretics, there were nothing. He had aspirin, and that's it. So he wasn't taking care of himself, which is typical of an alcoholic without alcohol. That's untreated alcoholism. That's exactly what it is. It's untreated alcohol. So, you know, I go to the doctor on a regular basis. I go to the dentist on a regular basis. I mean, I get a pimple and I start, you know, I go to WebMD and I start saying, oh, that's cancer. I'm going to die. You know, I probably diagnosed myself as dying 10 times in the past 10 years, you know. And then I go to the doctor and I go, I'm having these terrible headaches. It's just like my little brother. I know I've got a tumor up there. Okay, we're going to go have a CAT scan. I go have a CAT scan, and I get a resentment at the, the neurologist because he says, hey, here's your CAT scan. It's unremarkable. Now, how can you do a CAT scan of my brain, my brain, and call it unremarkable? It ought to be the most remarkable thing in the world. You know, I got mad at him. You know, what do you mean unremarkable? I've got this tremendous pain in my brain. He goes, well, maybe if you didn't worry about it, you wouldn't have the pain in your brain. I'm like, geez. Unremarkable in a cascade means you're normal. It means there's nothing out of line that shows up that says that we've got a problem. And I'm like, and you know what? After I went and had the CAT scan and I quit worrying about this pain that was bothering my brain, and it had the pain that bothered my brain since, I think it really and truly was the $800 for the CAT scan that made me realize there's nothing wrong with my brain because look at my money going out of my pocket. You know? <laughs> but really and truly, I, I can self-diagnose myself WebMD is the, the most evil thing for Jim to get on because I'm a National Registered Emergency Medical Technician and WebMD, well, I can tell you exactly what's wrong with you. You know, I know exactly what's wrong with me. Nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm full of fear. Yeah, Donna. I do have another question. Mm-hmm. Where, when he says we go back to our lives, I mean, even before alcoholism became a problem. How about that? How about that? I'm going to ask Willie to give us a scenario, because his is a great scenario. When he got sober in Scotland, and it's been 28, almost 28 years, 28 years ago, he was asked to do this fourth step. And it's not, this is not written down in the book. And so if your sponsor says to you, this has worked for me, why wouldn't you do it? If you picked them as a sponsor, don't you want to do what they did to get where they are? Willie? You were asked to do what? Okay. Uh, just to give you a, a very brief sketch. I'd gone in and out of A for more than 12 years. And the longest period I was away from Lewis was right at the very beginning when they asked me to do 90 days and 90 days. It was the best money collection I did that. I remember telling that and that was right at the time, you know, that sounds pure now. So I stopped there with this room and bought a quarter bottle of whiskey. And I didn't realise that that quarter bottle of whiskey was going to be the start 
of me going in and out for 12 years. I'll never get another leg to do it in that 12 years. You see, he didn't go out to Scotland at that time. And I went to thousands of meetings during that period. The only, that's the only thing I ever did right, was I kept going back to meetings. When I was hunting bad and badly enough, I would crawl back to AA. Because I knew there had to be an answer for somebody like me. Yeah. Uh, in the West of Scotland at that time, nobody spoke about the big book or the steps. Yeah. Some of the meetings that I went to, I swear to God, anyone in the room who mentioned God or higher power or Jesus Christ, you were asked to leave the room. We're not here for that nonsense. We're here for prayers. But to cut a long story longer, when I was introduced to this book, when I was on the 24th of March 1985, and it was suggested to me that I start to study it, because that's what it is, it's a textbook. It's meant to be studied and referred back to. I went through this process, and up to this point, when it came to the examples, you know, of Mr. Brown and Mrs. John, the four-step examples, and I could not make head or tail of it. It didn't make sense to me. As I was saying to Jim outside, up to that point, I'd been reading this book, you know, line by line from left to right. That's the way we read. So when it came to the example, I was doing the same thing. I was reading it along the way, instead of reading it up and down and called the way he's breaking it down today. And this is really inspiration for me, just listening to it. You'll be too much surprised, you pal. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, and, in, in my own case, I think maybe at that time, maybe I wasn't meant to make head or tail of it. It wasn't meant to make sense to me. Because that was the first time in my life I had to learn to swallow my pride and go and ask someone for help. And the man that I went to ask for help, he was my sponsor, he was a Catholic priest, he was a long time sober in the way. And I went down and I said to him, you know, I'm looking for some advice on the four step. And at that time, in our area, some of the guys had started handing out these four-step inventory guides, the Joe and Charlie ones, the one that Jim's handing out today. Father McLaren had never seen them, and neither had I. I'd never seen them. And Father McLaren said to me, he said, well, I said, let's read what it says in the book. And just as, as Don has mentioned, in there it says, uh, we went back over our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. We went back over our lives. And your question was, you know, uh, why do we have to go back into our lives before drinking? And I remember saying to Father McClellan at that time, that I didn't start drinking until I was about 21, 22. And Isaac McClellan said to me, well, he said, just go home and get a piece of paper and start writing. He said, write down everything you can remember up until you were 15. And you know in chapter 5 it says that some of these we bought. And I remember saying to him, wait a minute, pal. I didn't start drinking. So he said, just go home and get writing pads. Write it down. And I did that. And it took me quite a wee while, about three, four weeks. When I went back and I shared it with him, he was able to point out to me that I suffered from the effects of this illness. Simple as that says. All through my you know, my growing up period, I suffered from the effects of this illness. But up to the age of fifteen I was a thief for that and a cheat and a con artist. I had all these character defects and stuff before I even started drinking. And then he said to me I wanted to continue doing the same thing in five year cycles. And at that particular time I worked in the gambling industry. And I remember him saying to me, he said, I'll have a bet with you right now. He said, I've no idea the things that you might tell me that happened in your later life after you left high school and went to work in London. He said, but I'll have a bet with you right now. It was just a repetition of everything you did on the two years 15. And I remember looking at him and thinking, are you in for a surprise, pal? The things that I've done. But you know he was dead right. He was dead right. That's why it says we went back to our life. This is why I believe it's vitally important. Now this is Jim's deal. I, I just want to sit here and listen. I'm a man of very few words. I mean, you I stop me. But you can even start you want to stop. You'll be here for a <laughs> Trust me. But the answer is to your yeah. question, what he just said. 
and I did the same thing. I started drinking, my first drink was at 11 years old. Okay, it was like, my oldest sister got married in Minnesota, everybody in the, the military family that I was raised in was allowed to have a sip of champagne to toast her. My story is I gulped mine down and I went back and I kept going by that, that champagne fountain until I got five or six more in me and I was hammered. Okay, but before I was 11 years old, when I looked at, when I was 10 years old, I was walking home from school with two kids on a military base, and we found a little mouse, and one of the kids got bit by the mouse, and we saved the mouse, and he took it home in his lunchbox, and his mom called my mom, and my mom came in my room and said, did you get bit? And all that went through my head, okay, I didn't like school, as you can probably tell, um, was that I probably don't have to go to school if I tell her I got bit, right? So I lied, which is what I've been doing for, I remember when I was seven years old, I lied when I set a field on fire in, in Japan. I ran out there, I lit the matches, the field caught on fire, I ran back to my house, I picked up the phone, which was automated, uh, Yokota Air Force Base, my dad's deputy commander, the, the fire department picked up the phone. I didn't dial the fire department. I didn't know how to dial them. I just picked up the phone and yelled, fire, and hung it up. And my dad came home, did you set the fire? No. What? Hell, they had reverse 911 back in 1957. They knew who called. I was a liar. When I lied about, did I get bit? Yeah, I got bit. I, I don't want to go to school. Guess what I got? Rabies shots. Yeah. They were not good then. They were not good then. You know? They were the most painful thing in the world. Why? Because I lied. And then once I realized, oh my God, I've lied, I'm going to get these shots. I didn't get bit. Look, look, at, there were no bite marks on me. But because you said you got bit, maybe you got bit. And, you, and I, every day, I had to go get a rabies shot until they found out mouse was not rabid, and that took 11 out of 14 days, 14 shots is what they gave you, I had to have 11 shots. Why? Because I was a liar. Before I ever had alcohol, I was a liar. I was a cheater, I was a thief. I'd been stealing things without people knowing it before I ever had a drink. Like Willie said, I had these defects of character before I ever took a drink. When I took a drink, it was pouring gasoline on it. They jumped through the roof. Because after I had a drink, I couldn't think of anything else but drinking alcohol. And what alcohol did to me was made me think I could get away with anything. And my story is that I spent most of my teenage years either breaking into houses or going to jail. First it was juvenile homes for long periods of time. I'd get out of the juvenile home, I'd get alcohol in me, I'd break in somebody's house, I'd get caught. It wouldn't be the first time I broke in. I might break into 20 homes before I get caught. But the reason I broke into your home was so I could sell your stuff so I could get booze. It would have been easier if I just went and got a job and bought booze, but I never thought of that. I wasn't quite qualified to think like that. I was a thief. So I spent most of my youth in juvenile homes, jails, institutions, and finally a chain gang when I was 18 years old. And let me tell you something. If you didn't get your mind right in a chain gang, you know, you probably had a real problem. I didn't get my mind right. I just never went back to prison after that. But when I came out of there, it wasn't like I quit drinking. I quit doing drugs. Or I just didn't. I stopped breaking into houses. Or I stopped getting caught. I still broke into houses for a while, but then I decided, this is stupid. And a number of years later, in my mid-20s, I made reconciliation with my dad. I got into a, a nice career path. And... All the drugs went away, but drinking was acceptable, you know. I didn't drink during the day. I didn't drink at work. I didn't drink on the job. I didn't drink with my clients. How can I be an alcoholic? You know, 25 years later when I walk in the door, how can I be an alcoholic? Why are you telling me I'm crazy in the second step? And for three years, I came in and out of the doors saying, I am not crazy. And then I would pick up the first drink and I wouldn't know what was going to happen. Now, is that the definition of insanity? Pretty close. For Jim, it was pretty close. Okay, I'm going to read the next paragraph and then we're going to take a couple minutes. Yes. Maybe just a quick observation on what Donna said. Sure. After the example 
on you know the four step examples in page sixty five. Right. Right underneath it, it says we went back through our lives. Nothing it counted. Doesn't, it doesn't say we went back through our drinking lives. Right. We went back through our lives. Right. That's it. And it says, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. Yeah. And, and the thing about this big book is, like Willie said, it's to be studied. And it's to be taken, you know, as, as a textbook. I believe if you study it line by line, you'll find out it takes a lot more thought than it does if you just read it like it's a novel. You know, hey, this is a great book. This guy was drunk. He had a spiritual experience. He did these things. Okay, that's great. And if you take it line by line, nothing can but third us. All right. It says that we never apologize to anyone for depending on our creator. My God, I don't, I don't go out. I'm not marching up and down the street, you know, with a banner. But I am trying to tr- practice a spiritual way of life. Not just for an hour a day in the rooms. But I'm trying to be good to other people in all my affairs. I'm trying to practice this way of life, but I'm not trying to be, you know, some preacher. And it says, I don't have to apologize for, for depending on God. And we, we can laugh at those who think spiritually, spirituality is a way of weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. Now, I gotta look up paradoxically, right? It says, conflicting with expectation or opposite to one, what, what one might expect. So the opposite of what I expect is that it's a weakness, it's really a way of strength. And it goes on to say that the verdict of ages is that faith means courage, and all men of faith have courage. They trust their God, they never apologize for God. Instead, we never apologize, and we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And that's the prayer on the bottom of that. Remove my fear and direct my attention to what you would have me be. That's the prayer on page 68. At once we commence to outgrow fear. But the big part in that whole thing was we let him demonstrate through us. It's not that I'm walking around telling you what God has done for me. What am I doing when I don't know that you're watching? If you follow me around for 23 hours after I live, leave a meeting, am I getting in traffic and flipping people off and screaming at them, telling them, get the hell out of my way? Or am I waving to somebody and letting them in? You know, what am I doing? Sure, I, I've told you before, I, I have anger, I have problems, but what am I doing about them? Am I letting them consume me or am I really depending on God? Do I stop during the day and ask God to help me with things? Absolutely. Did I ever even think about asking God before I got here? No clue. No clue. You know? Alright. <clears throat> now we're going to take, I don't know, we're going to take a couple minutes, probably long enough for me to have a cigarette, and then we're going to talk about the three words. Now about sex. <laughs> okay, so if you want to go to the bathroom or take a couple minute break, take a couple minute break, and then we're going to come back in and we're going to pick back up. All right, now we're going to go to the one that everybody gets worried about because I'm never going to tell anybody about my sex life, period. My sex life is so horrendous and it's so bad that I just am not. But then it says right after the fear, it goes, now about sex. Most of it, and we're on the bottom of page 68, most of us needed an overhauling there. But above all, we need to be sensible on this question. Now, you, I'm going to just tell you that the first hundred people of Alcoholics Anonymous are the people we're talking about when they talk about we. In this book, it's the first hundred people that got sober that helped write this book. Bill Wilson did a lot of the writing, but he had the first hundred that actually got sober four years after this program started. Bob and Bill met in 1935 and 1939 is when the book was written, and they had about a hundred plus or minus people that were participating in this book. And it says, we had to try to be sensible on this question. It's easy to get off track. Here we find human opinions run into the extreme, absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry out that sex is the lust of our lower nature, a base necessary for procreation. Then we have the voices who cry out for sex or more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, 
who think that most of our troubles of the race are traceable to our sex cause. So, it's telling us, once again, that we're going to need to look at our sex conduct. And so, we have the same format that we have for our resentment. We have the same format that we have for our fear. And remember, this is not something we're going to share in a group. This is not something we're going to tell the world about. What we're trying to do is put these things down to look at why we did the things we did, and we're going to try to get rid of them. And we're going to share them with one person. We're going to share them with our sponsor. We're going to share them with our priest. We're going to share them with a closed mouth friend, is what the book says. We're going to share them with whoever it is. But unless we get these things out of us, the book tells us there's a promise. And you know what that promise is? If we don't do this, we're going to drink again. And for us to drink is to die. It's already told us that on the other page. So what we do is, we think, you know, it says the trouble of the race is traceable to sex. This is on page 69 now. They think we do not have enough of it, and that's not the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow a man no flavor for his fare. I love the way they write this. And the other would have us on a straight pepper diet. And this is where I've got in my little, my little, uh, notations off to the side. That this was a great move by Bill and Bob. Alright, the founders of our program. You know, it was a great move by the people who wrote this book. It's the next sentence. You know? We want to stay out of this controversy. We don't want to be the arbitrator of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. But what can we do about it? Okay? We reviewed our conduct. That's what that uh, that review of our sex conduct right there. And it says right there, where had we been selfish, dishonest, inconsiderate? All right? So the first one is I, resu- I reviewed my sex conduct over the past years. Who did I hurt? What did I do? What feelings did I create in the third column? You know, did I arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Fourth column says, where had, where had I been selfish or dishonest, self-seeking or frightened? What character defect caused me to do what I, what I do to harm a, another person? And this is in sex. And then the, the fifth column is all about what should I have done instead? Now, it says we reviewed our own sex contact in the years past, where we'd been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate. Whom have we hurt? And, and it's just like on the paper there, you know, in the book, it says, did we unjustly harass jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? You know, this piece of paper that I handed out, just, uh, those are the columns, right there. It says it in the book. It says it in the specific guidelines to what we should do. We got all this down on paper and we looked at it, all right? The reason we're writing this down is we're seeing it as we're writing it. We're feeling a lot of these things as we're writing them down. These resentments, these fears, the sex conduct, we're feeling it again because we're writing it down. And because we put it down on paper, we're looking at it, and it's in this way we try to shape a sane and sound idea for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? I don't know. I know what mine was. When I wrote mine down, mine was a lot of selfishness. When I married my ex-wife, and we were married 21 years, I thought I married her because of love. When I did this four-step inventory, I married her because I was in lust. They start with the same letter, they have the same amount of letters, but they're two entirely different things. I didn't really know what true love was until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had people who were loving me for no reason other than they were loving me, because they were sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they saw the pain I was going through. And I found out what true love was, brotherly love, not you know, going out and having a romp in bed. Our first date, I didn't find this out until I was almost divorced. We went through counseling. Our first date 
who was me getting drunk, taking a bunch of pills, and getting naked and getting in bed with her. That was our first date. She was dating my best friend. That was our first date. Normal people, when they date, they take somebody out to dinner, they meet the parents, they go get to know each other before they have sex. That's not the way Jim's life was running. Jim's life was running on self-will, and so sex was, you know, driving me on a lot of things. And it talks about this is, this is, I'm trying to get a sound idea for my future sex life, okay? We ask God to mold our ideas and help us live up to them. We remember always that our sex powers, and this is important, we remember always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good. All right? They're neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or lowered, loathed. Nor, I, wrote, I wrote down nor misunderstood. But, you know, the, the book says they're, they're not to be used lightly or selfishly, nor are they to be despised or loathed. And that goes back to those two different things. You know, one school of thought would say it's just, you know, for our lust for our lower nature, procreation, and the other ones that say, you know, we, we should have sex whenever we want to. That's up to you. That's up to you. But if your sex conduct had been like mine, which harmed people, then I need to put it on paper. I needed to look at it. Because like, like somebody said earlier, later on, there might be something I have to make amends for. And I did. I had to make amends for certain things. Certain things I had to leave alone. That's why you have a sponsor. Because you really don't want to go running around making amends to people until you've actually run this by somebody. I thought it would be a good idea to make amends to a good friend of mine who I had sex with his wife when they were separated. But when I got sober, they were not separated and they had a two-year-old child. But I still thought it would be a good idea to make amends to him because I had harmed him. What does it say? We make amends when we're not going to hurt anybody else. It says, we made a list of all persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. I was willing to make amends to him. Had I gone and done it, I would have destroyed his life, his marriage, his wife. Because in the ninth step, it says, except when to do so would injure them or others. And luckily, my sponsor said, we'll take that one off your list. Leave them alone. And then, you know, that's what I did. I left them alone. All right, the bottom of 69, it says, whatever our idea turns out to be, we must be willing to grow towards it. We must be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided that we do not bring still more harm in doing so, and so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, now, meditation is not mentioned until the 11th step, but it's mentioned quite a bit before then. It talks about that we be still before our God, whatever our God is. You know, prayer is asking God, meditation is listening. And I don't always hear God booming in my head, but I can tell you in my heart I know when it's the wrong thing, and I know that's when God's telling me that I shouldn't be doing it. And if I've been harming people with my sex conduct, I need to stop doing that. We ask God in meditation what we should do about each specific matter. And if we want it, it says right there, the right answer will come if we want it. If we're willing to work for a spiritual way of life, the right answer will come. And God alone, bottom of page 69, God alone can judge our sex situation. My sponsor can't judge it. I can't judge it. You can't judge it. The other person that I might have harmed really doesn't have a right to judge it. The only judge in my life is God. People can tell me when I'm wrong, but the only one that can judge me is my higher power. I don't have a right to judge anybody, because if I had the right to judge other people, then my God tells me that I have to judge myself first. And if I judge myself first, I wouldn't be here. I would have continued to eat a purgatory many years ago for my conduct. So I don't have a right to judge. God has a right to judge, and he's the only one that can judge. And that's for everything. Not just for sex, but that's for everything. Counsel, I'm going over to page 70. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. So I do run it by my sponsor, but God's still going to be the final judge no matter what. 
I, I run it by my sponsor to make sure that I'm not crazy. And we do realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. You know, the guys I work with, we're working out of the book. I'm talking out of the book. I'm reading out of the book. And so they, when they ask me, what should I do about this? And I, I almost always want it something to do with, you know, this girl or something to do with relationship. But you need to ask God. You're asking me for advice. I can't give you advice. I can show you what I've done in my experience since I've been sober and what I've done wrong since I've been sober. And I've done things wrong. I've learned from it. But I haven't harmed anybody. I haven't gone out and intentionally harmed somebody since I stopped drinking. When I look back on my drinking, I harmed a lot of people. And I didn't care. You know, that was the big difference. Alright, the next paragraph, it says, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? And some people tell us so. I mean, they say you're going to get drunk if you do this. And that's only the half-truth, the book says. It depends on us and our motives. If we are sorry for what we've done and have an honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we'll be forgiven and we've learned our lesson. Okay? And I believe that when I've made mistakes and I go to God and ask for forgiveness, that I am forgiven. Because I'm not doing it intentionally. You know? I'm not trying. But if I drink and I go out and do something, I know I'm doing it intentionally. If we're not sorry, the book says, and our conduct continues to harm others, that's where the book tells us, based on the experience of these first hundred people, the people who got sober and the ones who continue to drink and die, commit suicide, commit murder, go to jail, go to institutions, they continue to harm people. Their conduct continues to harm people, and the book says right there, we are quite sure to drink. We're not theorizing. These are the facts out of their experience. And they put it in writing. And so for those people who agree on that statement right there, they're not making it up. They're saying, based on our experience, we have seen that if I continue to harm, if you continue to harm somebody with your conduct, you're going to drink. And the book's already told us for me to drink is to die. And that's the same one die today. You know, it could be a 20-year death roll. But I'm not coming back. You know, I'm at the end of my career of drinking. If I drink now, it's over. The next paragraph says, To sum it up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. All right? And and this is... This next sentence is, is pretty important because it's also about what do I do when I'm disturbed, when I'm depressed, when I'm in fear, when I'm in anger, when I'm full of self, what do I do? Well, it says it right there. If if it's troublesome, we throw ourselves into the harder into helping others. If sex is troublesome, we try to help somebody else. Before Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't give a damn about anybody else. But I know that when I'm in situations where I'm consumed with myself, even today, when I still think about myself, and I'm in self, and I'm thinking about myself, and I'm self-centered, and I'm selfish, I'm in self-pity. The only thing that's going to get me out of it is not me. It's you. If I can help you, if I can go listen to you, if you're having a bad day, and I say, how are you doing? And you go, oh, my day's horrible. And I go, tell me about it. And I listen to you. And you feel better at the end of it, then I've helped you. And it's helped me. Because I don't want to drink. I don't want to do something that hurts somebody. It takes us out of ourselves. You know? And we're already talking about, almost all of these things are talking about self. self Self-centered, selfish, self-pity. Now the next paragraph. Well, let's say, if sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder to help others. We think their needs... We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It's quite a perilous urge when to yield would mean heartache. Okay? Now, we're getting near. We're getting, we're getting near what we need to do. Okay, we've looked at our sex conduct. We looked at our fears. We looked at our resentments. 
And what you're going to find, I think, is that self is going to be written up in there a lot. You know, for me personally, I was a very selfish, self-centered person. And I know that today. And if I don't get rid of that self by a power greater than myself, because it tells me in the book that I can't get rid of self by myself. And I really can't have somebody like a human get rid of self for me. I have to ask God to relieve me of that self. And he does it by when I help other people. Okay, it says down here at the bottom of page 70 that if we've been thorough about our personal inventory and we've written down a lot, we've listened and analyzed our resentments, we've begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. The five words on that page that talk about their death, how they kill us. We've commenced to see this terrible destructiveness. We've begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. The sick man prayer. You know, I wouldn't treat a sick man that way. Now, the the prayers, like I said, there's prayers and there's promises on every step. The prayers on our, on our sex conduct are down there on page 69 and 70. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. That's a prayer. And we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and strength to do the right thing. Now, if we've listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and are willing to straight, or it says we have listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. All right? And I use, and, and these formats are not mine. I want you to know they're, they're used by other people who do this. But the last one that I write down is what it says right there when it talks about we've listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and I have this handout that says that we've res- review of our our harms other than our sexual harms. Okay? So what we're doing is the same thing that we've done before. I'm going to keep passing that. We're writing down five columns. Who did I harm or hurt? What did I do or fail to do that caused the harm? What part of me caused me to do what I did? Was it a social instinct, the security instinct, or the sex instinct? And this is harms other than sexual. Where had I, where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Again, what character defects? That's what we're looking for. We're looking to write down what we consider to be character defects. And what should I have done instead? The fifth column. What should I have done instead? Now those, those things, when we're doing them, and we're writing them down honestly. And we're writing them down thorough. We're getting ready to share this with somebody. But we have to be convinced that we've written all this down. I never, I never tell people how long it's going to take them to do this because I don't have a clue. You heard Willie talk, talk about it. It took him a long time. It, it wasn't done overnight. All I can tell you is what the book tells us to do. After the third step, it tells us at once, or immediately, it doesn't say immediately, it says at once, and it says next. So it's telling me that I need to be doing this right away. I need to be not, you hear people in meetings sometimes, I'm working on my four step, and the next week, I'm working on my four step, next month, I'm working on my four step. Well, you know, my little Scottish sponsor has this little coin that says around to it. On the coin it says around to it. And that's what the coin is. It's a, it's a wooden, looks like a wooden nickel. And it says on the other side, this is, this is for somebody who's always going to get around to it. And so I hand it to them after the second time they say, I'm working on it. Well, you're going to get around to it then. And then they usually look at me and go, I have to get around to it, don't I? I'm like, yeah, you need to do this because we're talking about our lives here. We're talking about getting this stuff down. We're not talking about, okay, I quit drinking, everything's hunky-dory. That's fine for people who are heavy drinkers. That's fine for people who got a DUI because they got drunk last night. They're not alcoholics. I'm an alcoholic. My problem centers in my mind. If I don't do something about it, if I don't try to find a spiritual basis of life, I'm screwed. I'm doomed. So what am I doing? I'm trying to do these steps. The best of my ability... And I'm not rushing, but I'm doing them at once. 
I'm doing these things at once. If my sponsee calls me and says, I've finished my four-step, when can you meet me? My answer is now. Now, if I can't meet them now, I don't tell them now. But it's as soon as possible. Because if they finish their four-step, they need to do their fifth step so we can do the sixth and seventh step so they can take this list and start doing their eight steps so they can start making their amends so they can continue to do this program. You know, when you hear people say, take your time doing the steps, I never heard that. Never heard that at all. Dr. Bob was eight days sober when he and Bill went and met Bill Dotson, the man on the bed. But you see the picture of them sitting around the man on the bed. Dr. Bob had had his last drink eight days. And he was already helping another newcomer. Had he done all these steps? They didn't have the steps. They had these precepts or they had these six things from the Oxford group that him and Bill had been going to that were the predecessors of the 12 steps. But they were practicing the spiritual way of life. They weren't drinking one day at a time. They were trying to clean up their own mess. They were making amends. They're doing it all out of the order we do it now. After four years, this is the order that they came up with. And I think that this order came to Bill from God. I really do. When he wrote these 12 steps out, it took him about 30 minutes. And I think he sat down, and I think God said, this is how we do it. He used some of the Oxford group, and he used some of real life, what they could see in four years of experience. Okay? Jim, for this last sheet, sure. harms other than sexual. Right. I assume that uh, includes the period before we drank. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If you if you write it down, and let me tell you, when you're doing this, if you think about it, write it down. If you write it down, do not cross it out. Okay? The human mind is faster than you think. If you think about it and you write it down, don't cross it out. You need to share that with your sponsor. Because you might cross it out thinking, I really don't need to do this. But a third party, a human, because you and God already know what you did, Right? I mean, if you have a God, you already believe that God knows what you did. But when you're sharing it with another human, they might have a different take on it. And if you're sharing it with somebody who's closed mouth and you trust, which I hope your sponsors are, not everybody in this world is, but I hope your sponsors are, then you're going to get a different take. And so if you think about it, write it down. If you write it down, don't erase it or cross it off. It might be nothing. Maybe you don't need to make amends. There's a ton of times where I tell people, you need to just leave that person alone. For the rest of your life, you just need to leave that person alone. Anything you go back and do, you're doing as a selfish, self-centered person if you're going to harm them. And if you're going to drag them back through the mud that you dragged them through before, by you trying to feel better for yourself, then that's selfish and self-centered. And that's an eighth and ninth step. You know, I'm getting... I'm jumping way ahead to another whole section of the book. But what I want, the, the harms done others have nothing to do with when I was drinking. Okay? This book has already said before we started this, that liquor was but a symptom. So alcohol has got to go out of the picture. It's not what I did when I was drinking. It's what have I done in my life? My entire life, like what is it? What have I done before I was drinking, while I was drinking? What have I done after I was drinking? before I've done this fourth step. Because there was a period between the first step and the fourth step, I was still doing some stupid stuff. Because I was just getting newly sober, I was I was trying to do the right thing, but I was still making mistakes. And today, almost 11 years later, I still make mistakes. I make less mistakes today. I make them quicker. And I make amends for them a lot faster. I don't harm people today. I really don't. I might say something that hurts your feeling, and I'm sorry. And I'm sorry is okay for a hurt feeling. But to make amends, to make it right, to amend a wrong, that's a lot more than saying I'm sorry. And again, I'm jumping ahead in the book. We're way up there. But this is where it's going to come from. This is where your eighth step is going to come from. These harms that you've done people, that you've got in your brain that I don't know about because I'm not a, a brain reader. I'm not a mind reader. Okay? you got to share them with somebody. It says if we don't share them with somebody, 
we're not going to get over our drink problem. And I haven't drank for 60 days. I'm on my four step. My guys, 60 days, have usually done a four step now. But my sponsor understood that I was one of these people that still needed a little bit of time for alcohol to clear me. But you know, the bottom line is, how are you doing? If you're doing what the step says, the step says searching in fearless moral inventory. I'm looking at the wrongs, I'm looking at my harm, I'm writing them down. And this is where I'm going to find most of, not all, most of what I'm going to make amends for later on. Most of the things that I'm going to try to correct, not for me, but to correct what I've done. You know, if I'm just trying to make myself feel better when I'm making amends for the harms I've done, I'm still selfish and self-centered. But if I'm truly on a spiritual basis and I'm trying to help people understand that I have changed and what did I do? You know, what did I do? Well, I've written it down. I know what I did. And now I want to amend it. I want to make it right. Because if I don't do this, the book says I'm probably not going to get over my drink problem. And if I don't get over my drink problem, and alcohol is not my problem, what's my problem? My problem is me. And I can't stand me the way I am. So I have to drink. You know? And for me to drink is to hurt somebody and die. That's, that's Jim. And I'm just giving you real life experience from Jim. Alright, the last paragraph. 70 to 71. In this book you read again and again that faith, and I've got God, did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you're convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. Self-will. If you have already made a decision, which you did in the third step, apparently, and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, which we just did, you've made a good beginning. That, that, that being so, you followed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. And that's what you've done. If you're willing to be fearless and thorough about this, if you're willing to look at this from an entirely different angle, if you're willing to look at your defects of character, your selfishness, your self-centeredness, your self-will, you know, dishonesty, your sexual conduct, if you're willing to look at these things you've written down in the fourth step, and you're willing to do something about it, before you're going to run out and make amends, before you're even supposed to write a list, you're supposed to share them with somebody. Your fifth step, right? And after your fifth step, there's two very short paragraphs in the book. And they're called six and seven. And we're not going to go all the way through them. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to discover what our defects of character are. And we're trying to discard those defects of character without regret. We're trying to get rid of them. And you'll do that in 6 and 7 when you humbly ask God to remove your shortcomings. You can see the words up here, defects of character, shortcomings, um, wrongs. Um, what was the other one? Defects of character, shortcomings, sure. wrongs. Oh. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between any of those? What's the difference between a defect of character, a shortcoming, a wrong, is there any difference? At one point, Bill Wilson was asked that same thing. You know, why did he use those words, you know, like the exact nature of our wrongs and defects and shortcomings? And his answer was that when he was at college, he was taught not to use the same words in consecutive sentences. He said, they all mean the same. It's sin. That's it's our sin. That's it. And, and I haven't mentioned yet the 12 and 12, because I'm taking you in the big book. The big book was written 13 years before the 12 and 12. Some people hate the 12 and 12. Some people love the 12 and 12. I couldn't get sober on the 12 and 12. Matter of fact, until I did the 12 steps, I didn't get to read the 12 and 12. But in the 12 and 12, it talks about the seven deadly sins. And it always talks about pride being the number one, which is my self. My selfishness, my self-centeredness. And then the book says, selfishness, self-centered is the root of my problem. And that's what it is. The root where everything grows out of me is selfish and self-centered. So I can't get rid of it on my own. 
I've got to ask God to take away that selfish, self-centeredness. And when he takes it away, then I care about you more than I care about me. Because I want you to grow. I want you to live. You know, I'm going to grow and live. I'm doing this program the best of my ability each day. But I want to help to other people. You know, I want to be a maximum service to God and my fellows. You know? I, uh, I say it all the time when I speak. I don't say it all the time because there's times where I get choked up, um, and there's times where, <clears throat> where I forget. You know, I, I forget sometimes to tell people about in the third step prayer, take away my difficulties so victory over them may bear witness of those I would help. Right? Okay. When I was 17 years old, I was shooting up a lot of dope. I'm an alcoholic. Bottom line. But the 60s were a rage of everything. I got hepatitis from dirty needles. When I was 18 and I was sentenced to 52 years of rape for state prison, I had hepatitis a second time. I almost died the first time. I still shot up with dirty needles. Now fast forward all those years, I drank after I quit doing drugs. I drank hard. I drank the blackout for another 25 plus years. I came in here. I got sober. My son challenged me to become an EMT. I went out to the college. They wouldn't let me in the college because I got a GED from a chain gang that says I didn't pass a course. And so I had to take a test to get into Valencia College. Then I got into this class with a book about that thick, about three inches thick, the most advanced medical degree. You had to take all these big word tests. You had to take all this medical stuff. I had no clue. I knew I was going to fail. And I already paid for the course. Typical alcoholic. Pays for the course. Doesn't know what he's getting into. I went to the paramedic instructor. I said, look, I paid for the course. I'm going to come to the course, and I'm not going to cause any problem. They nicknamed me Pop in the class. There were 60 of us. I was the oldest person in the class. I was older than the paramedics teaching. And the paramedic looked at me and said, I'll tell you what. If you just take it one day at a time, we'll see how things turn out. I got no clue if the guy was in the program or not. I've never seen him before. I'm a couple of months sober, and I've already paid for this course, and I'm going through it while I'm going to AA, and I'm working the 12 steps. Well, that course turned out to be an eye-opener for Jim, because like I said, I took the course, and God took the test. And not only did I pass the state exam, I passed the course with two Bs and an A. I passed the state exam, and then, being a typical alcoholic, I went for the national exam which technically said, by being in Orlando, I was licensed in 27 states to be an emergency medical technician. And God took that test, which was much more than the state test, and he passed that test. Okay? I wasn't planning on working in the hospitals or the ambulance. This is just something I wanted to have more knowledge when I'm on the road. Because I'm out there driving to Mississippi because that's where my son was taken. I passed the test. No, I'm sorry. I passed the course. God passed the test. And they say, you need the hep A and B vaccine. You're going to be called, maybe, to go into an emergency situation. I go to my doctor. He says, you don't need the hep A and B vaccine. You've had hepatitis C twice. You've got hepatitis enzymes in your body for the rest of your life. You've never been able to give blood for these 25 years. We don't need to give you this expensive and I said, well, great, you know, finally hepatitis C comes to be a great thing for me, right? Well, he says, we haven't done a blood test in a long time on you, let's take some blood. We'll just send it off, we're going to go from A to Z, and we'll find out. And then he calls me back in. My doctor at the time had been the former medical examiner for Seminole Orange and Osceola County. I go in there, I sit down, and I'm wondering why he can't call me on the phone and just tell me the results, right? You know? I sit down and he says, I don't know how to explain this to you as a medical professional. You have no hepatitis. You have no hepatitis enzymes in your body. And I don't know where they went. But whatever you're doing in this Alcoholics Anonymous, keep doing it. Take away my difficulties. Not once did I ever ask God to take away my hepatitis. And ten years ago, I don't know where it went. (laughs) I know where it went. God decided that I didn't need hepatitis anymore, you know, and I don't have hepatitis today. It's kind of a, I know it's God, I don't have any other way of explaining it, and when I got a medical professional telling me, I got no way of explaining it to you, this is the deal. 
I'm supposed to remember to tell you that because in that third step it says, take away my difficulties so victory over them can bear witness to those I would help. So I'm supposed to mention that whenever I talk to people. I'm supposed to let them know. I forget that all the time. I tell them about me almost dying from hepatitis and then I go on for all this other crap. And then I forget to tell them that God took away the hepatitis. Now also, you know, I heard a gentleman saying, and I like to end with this. Bill Wilson, on his second of the last talk, said that the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are not simply to be worked. They're to be lived. And so it's not really what I'm doing between the serenity prayer and the Lord's prayer that matters. It's what am I doing between the Lord's prayer and the serenity prayer. What am I doing for the other 23 hours of the day? Am I doing what I was taught in this room, out there in life, because I'm supposed to be living the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope I've helped you. I hope something helped you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, something I'm going to give you, because Willie's not here, okay? Just pretend Willie's not here, and you don't have any of his cards. I have some of his cards to a website. And the, uh, oh, I have a card also. I don't think I've shown you. This is from the NASA group of Alcoholics Anonymous in the Bahamas. I went on a cruise with my son a couple of years ago. I went down to the Bahamas. When I was down there, I said, I need to go to a meeting. I want to go to a meeting. There was some on the boat, but not very good. I pull up in front of this building with this taxi. There's all these people standing out outside. I see the AA symbol. I'm at, I'm at the right place. And I get out and I go, has this meeting started? And they go, no, we don't have anybody here qualified to chair a meeting. I go, what's your qualification? They said, 90 days of sobriety. I said, get the hell in the building. Let's have a meeting. I walk in there, and I chaired a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and National Bahamas. One of the guys gave me one of the cards that they had down there. Another God shot. Now, Willie's not here. I was going to give you his, his website, because he has the largest free website in the world, okay, of Speaker AA. I think there's over 22,000 right now individual speakers in Alcoholics Anonymous. He has a sister website that has um, workshops and conventions. And I was going to direct you to that site and tell you to go find this guy. who's a friend of mine. His name's Rob M. They call him California Rob. California Rob puts on a big book workshop. Um, every now and then he puts one on. Matter of fact, he's putting one on in a podcast starting on March 1st on Friday nights. Ten weeks in a row. You might have heard of California Rock, okay? He has one of the best big book workshops that I've ever heard. And I've heard a few, okay? But he has one of the best ones. He, he gave one here at Central a number of years ago. He allowed us to record it. Now, 10 weeks is 10 hour discs if you don't know how to work a computer. And so the workshop is all on a single disc. You can't play it on a CD player. You can play it on your DVD player, or you can play it on your computer. Okay? You can't see it. Okay? It's not a video. It's an audio. But the audio for 10 weeks has been crammed into 14 45-minute segments. And when you pull it up either on your computer or you pull it up on your DVD, you'll see that it's broken into 14 45-minute segments. And you can say, this week he talks about the fourth step. That's where these guidelines came from. You can say, this week he talks about the fifth step. This week he talks about more about alcoholism. This week he talks about how it works. This week he talks about six and seven. This is about the amends. It's one of the most comprehensive workshops ever done on Alcoholics Anonymous. And I would encourage you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm encouraging you to stick this thing into your DVD player, turn off all your outside influences, and listen to it an hour a week, an hour a day, and just listen to Rob walking through the big book. Have your big book with you, because he's going to refer back to pages. Now, he's been doing it 20 years. So he can tell you on page 62, it talks about selfish and self-centeredness is the root of our problem. He can tell you on page 77 that our main purpose is to be a maximum service to God and our fellows. He can tell you on page 28 that it tells me that there'll come a time in every alcoholic's life where he's got no mental defense against the first drink. 
Het bekend van het stem van de higher power. He'll tell you all those things. So I'm going to encourage you to listen to him too. All right? Okay, I've done my best. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, okay. Indeed. Oh. Job a lot harder. Good. <laughs> Good. I don't like the selfish and substance. <laughs> <laughs> and do something about it. But that's what it is, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. That's what it is, exactly. isn't it? That's why we don't want to look at it because that's what it is. So the idea is that we would fill out these forms and then go talk to our. That, that the idea is. Whatever your sponsor suggests you do, I suggest you do. But if your sponsor says don't don't use that worksheet, just do it out of the book. Just do it out of the book. The worksheet is my my way of so saying yeah. that everything in the book. You know, I didn't make up this last column. I read you out of the book where it said, you know, the fifth column. What should I have done instead? Yeah, it's there in the book. You know, just because they didn't show you in that example. It's it's there in the book. So. But having it spoon fed like this is, certainly makes it a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Yeah, so it, it's all grounded in the book. I yeah, absolutely. That, but there's a lot going on there in the text. And while I think it, the book is well written, it's not it's not presented in a programmatic kind of way. And, and I can tell you this, you know, they used to mail this book out in 1939 to people who were suffering from alcoholism. When Jack Alexander of the Washington, or of the uh, Saturday Evening Post in 1941 wrote his article, thousands of inquiries came into New York and they were just mailing the book out to wives whose husbands are alcoholics and they were saying, do, a, do the first three words on page 112. The first three words on page 12 and read this book. You know, read this book. How can I read this book and get sober unless I have somebody who's done what this book says? Help me. I, I'm not qualified. I am not qualified to read this book and go, I know exactly what they're saying to do. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I, I look at a three-column list and I say, okay, that's the three columns. But then it says, and then we looked at this. And then we looked at what I should have done instead. Well, those are two more columns. Yeah, no, that's helpful, those other two columns. Yeah, yeah, they were helpful to me, too. Yes. But they were helpful to me after I only did three columns the first time, and then I did another four step. And I'm not telling you you have to do more than one four step. I'm not telling you you have to do anything. I'm telling you what helped me. And if it helped me, I'm a pretty self-centered self puppy. It's got to be able to help other people. You know, it's just that. Very good. All right. Okay, I, I appreciate you all being here. Other than, other than Willie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.